Welcome to High Ridge Church Online. Here at High Ridge, we are a family of churches, and our hope is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. We have a lot of things going on at High Ridge Church. The best way for you to get the details you need for every event or ministry is on highridgechurch.com. You can also connect with us on any of our various social media platforms. If you have never joined us at one of our weekend services, we would love to have you. You can find directions and service times for each of our campuses online at highridgechurch.com. We encourage you to lean in with anticipation for what God is going to speak into your life. Thank you for joining us online today. Hey, good morning, everybody. Y'all doing well today? Good, good. You look you look like you have been stuffed with the goodness of the Lord this past week. You, you look you have that look of turkey and mashed potatoes, you know, in your in your face and pumpkin pie and all that goodness. Well, it is really really good to be here with you. Uh, my name's Andrew and um, I used to be on staff at High Ridge and now I have the privilege of leading uh, Hope Fort Worth, which is a ministry that works to help churches to connect to the needs of, of orphan and vulnerable children uh, here in our community. And uh, I just always appreciate the opportunity uh, when Pastor Zach gives me the chance to come out here. It's so pretty out here. We got to do some camping this weekend out at PK Lake and, and just spending some good time with family. And I hope you got the same privilege that we did of spending some good time with family and, and time with the Lord this week. How many of you have at least one social media account, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, something. Most everybody in here has social media. And if you're, if you're like me, there, you probably have a little bit of, number one, an addiction. Anybody have a, a problem? You're willing to confess. Some of you are like, yeah, I will. I will confess my sin right now, Pastor. You have an addiction like me. And also, the other thing is, I think about social media is I really love it. I, I enjoy following the trends. I enjoy all that stuff. And I really, really like it right up until the time that I don't like it. You know what I mean? Like, it's really great. It's a great tool, and it can be really fun to use. And then also, sometimes it can be really, really, really awful. And there's a couple things in there that, that, that really annoy me about it. But one of the things I've learned about social media now is that Everybody, almost everybody has social media accounts. Now, there's some of you that are out there that just dig your heels and say, I will not. I do not want the government finding out about me. And that's fine. You can spend your time building a bunker in your backyard instead of spending time on Facebook. That's, that's your right to do so. But everybody has social media. Even I, my grandmother is 87 years old now, and she has a Facebook account. And if you grandmas out there, you got Facebook. Any grandparents in the house that have a Facebook account? Yeah. And you know what they do, by the way, when they get that Facebook account is they stalk their grandchildren on Facebook. That is, that is the purpose. And so I used to be worried about putting stuff on social media and be like, what would my mom think if she read this, right? Now it's my grandma. And grandma guilt is like a whole nother level of guilt than just regular mom guilt, right? So a couple weeks ago, my wife and I played a prank on our daughter. And uh, we, we bought her a bunch of stuff that she didn't want, and we made her think that it was for real and she had to keep it. And so in typical 13-year-old fashion, she let us know exactly how she felt about the stuff that we bought her, right? And so I thought it was funny. I thought the interaction was funny, so I put it on Facebook, and I was like, my daughter said, I, this is what we did. We played this prank on her, and she just looked at us with death in her eyes and said, you're the worst parents ever, and you stink. My grandma saw that, and she wrote back, for shame, Rachel. For shame, talking to your parents like that. All of us are on social media. One of the things that if, if you don't know what this trend is, it's the thing that everybody does on Facebook at the end of their post, and it's the wonderful hashtag. You know the hashtag? There's a bunch of hashtags out there, and if you haven't seen them, look out for them because they are coming. There are people that, like, there, there's more hashtags than there is posts, right? And so there's a bunch of hashtags out there, and some of them are very, like, I, they're cool, but they're also kind of annoying because if you think about it, one of the things that, that's a downside to social media is everybody's putting their best foot forward all the time, right? So what you see on social media isn't often real life. And a lot of times people will put like hashtags that are these kind of like, they're kind of a way to brag, right? So there's, there's hashtag winning, 
right? Which means you just did something awesome. You want everybody to know about it. There's hashtag YOLO. You only live once, which that means you did something stupid, but you're still bragging about it. There's hashtag first world problems where you're complaining about something silly as a way to let everybody know that your life is really pretty great. You know, like, oh, I've been at this traffic light for five minutes. You know, you think about that. That's, you're really just complaining about nothing. But one of the most popular hashtags out there, the one that we're going to talk about today is the hashtag blessed. How many of you have seen hashtag blessed on social media? You've seen somebody post a picture. And what do they normally say when it's hashtag blessed? What are they normally talking about? Well, they're on vacation somewhere incredible. They've got, you know, the picture of their new baby. That's hashtag blessed mom, by the way. Uh, baby pictures. They're, they're on vacation. They're doing something cool. They're, they just, they're, they're living their best life. You know, everything's amazing, and they're hashtag blessed. And, you know, the reality is that for us as Americans, if there is anything that we are, it's blessed. Amen? We are blessed. God has blessed us richly and greatly with material wealth. And here's the thing. God does love to bless us. He does. He loves to bless you with material things. He loves to provide for you. He loves to take care of you. In the same way that if you're a parent, you love taking care of your kids. I mean, I complain about it sometimes, but I do generally enjoy spending money on my kids and providing for them and making sure they have food and clothing and shelter and all that stuff. And God looks at us the same way. He loves to bless us. But those material blessings, the things that we have a tendency to post on Facebook, the, the awesome vacation, the time with family, the, those types of things, those are just the surface of the blessings that God has for us. And so here's the question I want to put before you today. If all the surface stuff was gone, if all the material blessings are gone, would you still be blessed? Would you still say, that you're hashtag blessed. Because the reality is that God has blessed us in ways that go far beyond material things. He has spiritual blessings. He has things for us that are as Christians. And that's where we're going to focus uh, on the back end here of Thanksgiving. And as we go into a time of year where some of you have already given in to the consumerism monster, right? Because some of you went Black Friday shopping or you're going to do Cyber Monday tomorrow or, or something like that. And in this time of year where we're so consumed sometimes with material things, I want us to pause for a moment and focus on the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. So if you have your Bible today, we're going to spend our entire time today in Ephesians chapter 1. If you've got your Bible, you can open up to Ephesians chapter 1. You can pull it up on your phone. But let's dive in the text today and see what the Apostle Paul says in this letter about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And here's what he says, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The first thing I want you to notice here is that he says you have been blessed. This is past tense. He's not saying if you work really hard, maybe I'll bless you. He's not saying, hey, if, if you try, if you just do your best, then, then I'll, do, I'll do this for you. No, he says, hey, if you are a Christian, you are blessed. You have been blessed. This is something that's already happened. It's part of the work of Christ on the cross on your behalf. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And he says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So we're going to look at four different spiritual blessings from the text today. Four different things that we have because of Christ. And then as we close out today, we're going to talk about what those spiritual, what spiritual blessings really are and what they do for us. And the first spiritual blessing that we have from the Lord is that we have been chosen. We've been chosen by God. Let's turn to somebody next to you and say, God chose you. It's true. Turn to the other person and say it a little louder. That was better. The other person feels better about their chosenness right now. God chose you. Not only did God choose you, but the scripture tells us here that he chose you before the world was even made, which means before God did anything else, he was, he was in eternity past, and he was there as part of the Trinity, and he looked out and he said, I want that one, and I want that one, and I want that one, and I want him, and I want her. 
Yeah, even him, even that guy, I'm choosing you. How many of you have been um, in a situation in school before where you had to, uh, you, you, you were picking teams? Anybody been in the picking team situation before? If, and you're in that situation, did anybody here ever get chosen last? You didn't have to raise your hand. I didn't ask you to. That's kind of like, yeah, I stunk. I, so everybody gets chosen last at something, right? Anybody out here get chosen first? You're like, yes, I was the first pick in something once upon a time. No winners in the house. All right, great. When I was in that situation, there was one sport that I always got chosen last for, and it really shouldn't be any mystery as you're looking at me up here on the, on the platform right now. I was always chosen last in basketball. I am short, I am not skinny, and I cannot jump, right? Which is, you need, you need a few of those things. You need to be a little tall, usually a little lean, and you need to have some hops, and this boy doesn't have any of that stuff. Basketball, chosen last. Pie eating contest. Now, that's another story. Pie eating contest, I'm your first round choice right there, you know? Everyone's looking, who am I going to pick on my pie eating contest team? Fatty. We'll get him. We'll take him. He looks like he's healthy. He looks like he knows how to put down a pie. All of us have been in that situation. Here's the thing. God chose you first. First. For anything else. Here's the thing, too, I think we've got to grab hold of this morning. God didn't choose some future awesome version of you. He chose the you that's sitting here right now. He chose the you that you know exactly how bad you are on the inside. He chose you when you're at your worst. And he said, I want that one first. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he looked down and he said, I, I know how bad it is. I know how bad you are. I know the thoughts you have in your head. I know the tendencies you have. I, I know the propensities and the sin and the things that you struggle with. And still yet, I choose you. And I'm not choosing you with just hoping that you're going to get better. I'm choosing you because I love you. That's what he did for us. Verse 5, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The second spiritual blessing that we have from this passage today is not only did God choose us, but God adopted us. Not only were you chosen by God, but God goes even a step further, and he says, not only do I want that one, but I want that one to be my child. And as my child, as my adopted son and daughter, I'm giving them exactly the same full legal right and standing as my son, Jesus. Which means this, for you and I, when we, have, we become in Christ, and when God's chosen us and he's adopted us, then we become legally his sons and daughters. And that means we have everything. Somebody say everything. Everything that belongs to God belongs to us. Everything. And so when you're reading in the scripture and you see a verse that talks about what God wants to do for his people, that's for you. Because you're his child. And you get everything the father has. In the field that we work in, we get to, to be a part of a lot of great stories of adoption. And one of them, I shared with you a couple weeks ago, but there was one story that was about a 15-year-old boy named Drake. And one of the really cool things that happened is a week and a half ago, Drake stood up in a courtroom way away from here in Ellis County, Texas. And he stood there with his newly adopted parents. And when, they, when the judge picked up the gavel and banged the gavel and pronounced that Drake was now a member of the Gullet family, guess what Drake had? everything that his father had. Drake became to the Gullet family just like their other biological children and that they are given full legal, he's given full legal rights as a son. And that's what you have in Christ. Verse seven, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us 
in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So you've been chosen by God, you've been adopted by God, and then the the language here uses the term redemption, right? Redemption through his blood is the phrase, but the best way for us to understand that the word that we're gonna use that, that kind of captures the idea today is that one of the spiritual blessings that you have in Christ is you've been ransomed. Not, and what, what that means for you and I is not only did God choose us, not only did God adopt us, but God paid the ransom demand for your freedom. God loved you so much that he was willing to pay the ultimate price for you which was the blood of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And he was willing to do that to meet the ransom demand of the enemy. I love movies that have this kind of kidnapping ransom plot thing going on. Anybody else like those movies? They're kind of cool, right? I like the intensity of it. They're pretty like, they're, they're just tense situations. And I really like like the geopolitical thriller type thing where there's like a group of terrorists and they've kidnapped somebody and the president of the United States on, is on the phone with them, right, or via teleconference and they're threatening that they're going to kill these people if, if he doesn't give them money or release these hostages or do these, do these different things. And what happens every single time in those situations? What happens? The, the, the terrorists make the demand and then the president of the United States responds and he always says the same thing. And if you know, what I, you know what it is, you can say it with me. And it goes like this. We don't negotiate with what? You've seen the movie. Yeah. You've seen, the, you've seen that TV show. I think it was the plot of every single episode of the television for, show 24 uh, a few years ago. We don't negotiate with terrorists. Aren't you grateful that God didn't take that attitude towards you? Think about that for a second, because the, the ultimate terrorist, the enemy of your soul, had you hostage to sin. You were captive to him. And he went to the father and said, you can't have this one. This one's mine. And the only way you can have him is by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. That is my ransom demand for this one that I've held hostage. And God didn't say, ha, we don't negotiate with you. God said, I'm willing to pay it. And he paid on a cross, the price for your freedom. He paid the ransom demand for you so that you could be free from the power of sin. And sometimes we think about that idea of of freedoms from sin and we go, yeah, like I understand in this kind of general vague sense that I'm free from sin, but I'm pretty sure I still sin all the time. I'm pretty sure I still mess up all the time. I I mean, heck, if you have kids and you drove to church this morning, you probably sinned this morning on the way to church. (laughs) That's like the weekly sin in the Holland house. I think we we sinned on the way to this church this morning with the kids. We were camping out at PK Lake. We had to get everybody up, get them dressed, get out, get them out in the car. And somebody, I don't know, I'm not going to say which one, maybe it's the 13-year-old daughter, literally woke up and got out of bed at the time we needed to leave. And so we're, you know, we're probably, come on, come on. And by the time you're five to 10 minutes late, the demons come out of you. I mean, they just, you are in full on, you are in full on sin. You're, you're, there's screaming is happening at some point. I mean, there's just, there's nothing more unholy than your car on the way to church on Sunday morning, right? When you've got kids, it's bad. Yeah, you're still gonna mess up and you're still gonna make mistakes. You're still gonna sin because we still live in these earth suits that have been trained in sin. But here's what happens when you're ransomed and redeemed by God. Number one, Christ no longer sees you as sinful. He sees you as himself. God looks at you and sees the blood of Jesus on you, and he sees you as whole and clean and perfect. And here's the second thing. The bondage of sin is broken off your life, which means you don't have to anymore. Before, the Bible tells us we were slaves to sin. We didn't have a choice Our bondage was such that we would just sin because that was what was in our nature to do. But now, everybody say, but now. But now, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you have the power and the freedom over sin because of the work on the cross. And you can choose to walk in the Holy Spirit and choose to not indulge in the flesh and choose not to sin because of what Christ did for you. God paid the price so that you could be free from the power of sin. 
verse 11. It says, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So you've been chosen by God. He picked you first. You've been adopted by God. You've been given full legal rights as his sons and daughters. You've been ransomed. He paid the penalty for your sin and freed you from the bondage of sin. And lastly, God marked you or sealed you with the Holy Spirit. God has put his stamp on you. When we think, we, um, we're using the word marked here because in this verse there it says that we were sealed. And most of the time in our culture today, when I think of the word sealed, I think of like a Ziploc bag, right? Like a seal the bag, make sure that it's airtight. But the word picture here in the Greek is not that so much. It's more of the idea of a king, right? And so a king would, would want to send a message to somebody, but he had to make sure that the people that received the message knew that the message was really from him. This was pre-email days, right? And so what would he do? He had either a stamp or a signet ring that had his seal on it. And he would write the letter, and then he would pour some wax either on the page or to, to bind the letter together, and then he would mark it. He would stamp his signet ring on it, or he would stamp his seal on it. And that way, when the person opened it and they looked at it, they realized, hey, this is from the king. This is from the one who, who loves me. And for you... God has marked you with his seal. And he's looked at you and said, that one belongs to me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he has, he has marked you as his. Anybody here have a situation at work where you have a break room refrigerator where you can take food to eat while you're at work? Anybody do that? Take your lunch to work? Just a few of you. The rest of you either don't feel like raising your hands or all of you eat out way too much. Amen, yes. It's the case for me. Angela's really good about taking food to the office fridge. Me, not so much. There's, a, there's this thing where, you know, you, you, you take your food and you put your name on it and then it's gone. And someone at work stole your food, your food with your name on it. Could have been your leftovers. You could have licked it. I mean, they don't know, right? How gross is that? Who eats other people's leftovers? Some of you in here might be the people. That's, that's, you might have to do some soul searching after this message. I don't want to be that guy anymore. Eats the food out of the break room fridge. I mean, creamer, that's one thing. Creamer's fair game. I'm sorry. You can't put your name on creamer in the fridge. I'm putting it in my coffee. There's a Friends episode. This is a, a 90s show, if any of you out there were uh, children of the 90s like me. A little woot woot. All right, no, sorry. Okay, cool. So I was a kid of the 90s, and Friends was a really big deal, and there's this Friends episode, and it's a Thanksgiving episode, so it's appropriate to this week. And in this episode, Ross, one of the characters, is super excited about his post-Thanksgiving Day turkey sandwich. And he's really, really pumped about it because his sister's a chef and she makes awesome food and he's got this turkey sandwich on the way and Monica makes a sandwich for him, his sister, and this sandwich is special because it has a third slice of bread in the middle. And this third slice of bread is dipped and soaked in gravy and then put in the middle of the sandwich and it's called the moist maker, right? And it keeps, every, keeps all the turkey from drying out and it makes the sandwich delicious. And so Ross is really pumped about his sandwich with the moist maker and he walks into the break room at work and he pulls the sandwich out of the fridge, except it's not there. And he looks over and there's a dude eating his sandwich at the table and then Ross has a complete meltdown and gets fired, right? And why did, why did the person eat a sandwich? Well, they didn't, he had his name on it, but they didn't care. It's just Dr. Ross Geller, paleontologist. They didn't have any respect for him, right? But what if, you know, if you put your name on your break room fridge food and people eat it, that's one thing, right? But what if it's your boss's 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 boss? You know, the person who owns the company, 
their name is on the side of the building, right? Fred McGillicuddy Industries or something. I don't know what your boss's name is, but you're, the CEO, the main guy, writes his name on that sandwich and puts it in the fridge. Is anybody going to eat his food out of the fridge? No. They don't want to get fired. They would never touch his food. And in the same way, you have been marked by the boss's boss's boss, by the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of all the universe. When he chose you and adopted you and ransomed you, he stamped you with his mark, with his seal. And he says, this one belongs to me. And he lets everybody know and he lets every demonic force and every presence know, you can't have this one. I've called this one by name. They are marked with my seal and they belong to me. And here, here's how that works. God marks us so that in the unseen realm, no one can touch us. Which, by the way, I don't know if, if you realize this or not, but you have power over demonic forces. You are not subject to them in the same way that an unbeliever is. When you come up against something that's wicked and evil and vile, you have authority through the name of Jesus Christ to speak death to that thing. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have authority in those situations. You don't have to be frightened about that. You have to be wise about it, but you don't have to be frightened because God's marked you. And the enemy knows that you belong to God. And sometimes we go, how, would you, how do you know that you're in Christ? This is one of the ways that you know that you're in Christ is that you've been marked by the Holy Spirit, which means that when you sense the still small voice of the Lord leading you and guiding you, when you sense his nearness in times of trouble and comfort, when you get that check in your spirit that you should or shouldn't go do something, that's one of the ways that you know that you're in Christ because his Holy Spirit is with you. So these are some of the spiritual blessings that we have. We've been chosen, we've been adopted, we've been ransomed, and we've been marked. And I want to give you a couple things, a couple takeaways from this passage before we go. So if you're writing notes, there's four things real quick I want you to write down that, that we can take with us as we go. And here's the first one. Spiritual blessings take place in the unseen realm. That's what this verse tells us. It tells us that it takes place, they, these spiritual blessings come from heavenly places. And here's what that means. We talked earlier about hashtag blessed and how we always think about the things that we're grateful for in the here and now. But the reality is spiritual blessings can't be seen. They, they don't exist in the natural physical realm. You can't see them, taste them, touch them, or feel them. They take place in the heavenlies. It's, it's, the pre, it's present in the spiritual realm here on earth. Theologically, we talk about the, there's three different heavens. The first heaven is everything that you and I can see here right now. The third heaven is where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father, right? But the second heaven is the spiritual realm here on earth, which is very real and which is around us all the time, that which we can't see with our physical eyes. But one of the ways that we know that that realm exists is that is the realm where our mind and our will and our emotions and our thoughts and all of those things exist. If they didn't ex is exist, if there was only the natural world, you'd be able to see your thoughts, which would be scary for some of you, right? Nobody wants, like, like in a cartoon, can you imagine, like, you hear some horrible thought, just a word bubble, boop, boop. You're like, oh no, let me take that one back. Your thoughts exist in the second heaven, in the spiritual realm that's here on earth that we can't see. And here's one thing that we can learn from that. The only way for, we, for us to experience the fullness of the spiritual blessings that Paul's talking about in Ephesians here is to meditate on and think upon what God's done for you. That's why we're talking about this today. That's why we're making a point to, to talk about the fact that you're chosen and adopted and ransomed and marked because the only way for you to live like those are present reality in your life is to meditate on them. Here's the second thing. Spiritual blessings are only found in Christ. It says that over and over in this passage that in Christ we've been adopted, in Christ we've been chosen, in Christ we've been ransomed. It's because of the work of Christ that we've been marked with the Holy Spirit. And the only way that we can experience spiritual blessings is when we are alive in Christ, dead to sin and alive in Christ, when we have surrendered our life and our will to him and he has saved us from our sin. Every one of us, everybody here on the earth, experiences God's grace. Theologically, this is a, a term called common grace. Now there's common grace and then there's special grace or saving grace. Common grace is just the fact that just because you are a human being and God created you and he loves you, he provides certain things for you. Just right off the top, not because of anything else. 
Man, we know that because the scripture says that the sun shines on the just and the unjust, and it rains on the just and the unjust, which means that all of us, everybody say all, all of us, regardless of our relationship with Jesus Christ, experience blessings from God. It's the only reason this world doesn't just devolve into chaos, because God holds all things together in himself. But that's not the same as saving grace. It's not the same as, as being saved and being set apart by God. And the spiritual blessings we have only happen when God has saved us. Number three, spiritual blessings are a gift from God. They're a gift, which means this, you can't earn it. There is nothing that you can do to make yourself more attractive to God so that he will provide you more spiritual blessings. This is really important that we grab hold of because even with physical blessings, right, all the stuff that you enjoyed this week, like heaven's gift to us, the mashed potato, right, with butter and gravy as God intended. Even that, even every, every, uh, every material blessing, in some form or fashion, we can be tempted to take credit for in our own strength. We can say, well, you know, I did have to work for that money, it didn't come to me for free, right? But the spiritual blessings that you have in Christ, you can't take one bit of credit for it because you didn't do anything to get them. And your behavior doesn't change the fact that you have them. And here's the fourth thing. Spiritual blessings are eternal. I want you to think about this before we pray. Everything, every material blessing that you have right now eventually will go away. Every car, every house, every bit of food and clothing, even your family members, two to three to four generations from now, every person that you just had Thanksgiving dinner with, all of it will return to dust at some point. A brother was sharing me with before the service that there is a family in your community here that just got in a really bad car accident uh, north on 16. And a mom, and I think a mom and her daughter perished in that car accident just yesterday. Folks, we are all dust. I know that's not the most encouraging word at the end of a message, but it's truth. There's a reason why when we pass away that the, the, the tradition is to say ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Because from the ground we were made, God formed us and breathed life into us. And at the end when it's all said and done... It all goes back to the ground. It all goes back to the earth. But the only thing that's eternal is our spirit man that's living inside of us and the blessings that we have in Christ go with us. That's the only thing that goes with us. And so the question before us today is this. If everything else goes away, if everything else is bad, if everything else is the worst year you've ever had, if your family members die in a car accident, whatever the case may be, are you still blessed? Can you still claim honestly before the Lord to say, Lord, thank you for the fact that you chose me and adopted me and ransomed me and marked me. And even if everything else is bad, I'm gonna rest in that today. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Thank you, Lord. Once again, Lord, we choose to thank you that your word is good and true and right, and we can live by it. I thank you, God, that you have blessed us in ways that go far beyond physical blessings. And we're so grateful for every good physical blessing that you provide for us, Lord. We recognize that it's part of your graciousness towards us, but we also want to take time during this season and thank you for the spiritual blessings you've given us that we can't earn but that are eternal. They're gifts from you. And the only way for us to recognize them and walk in them and live in them is to think on them and meditate on them and incorporate them into our life. So Lord, we choose right now, no matter where we're at. Church, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what kind of good times or bad times you've been walking through. But here's what I know is that you are blessed because you've been chosen by God. You've been adopted by him. You've been ransomed by him. He paid the price for your sin and he's marked you and sealed you with the Holy Spirit. With every head bowed and every eye closed, it may be that you're here today and you 
say, you know, I don't know if I have that relationship with God. I don't know if I'm in Christ. I don't know if I have those spiritual benefits because I'm not certain of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, friend, we want to give you an opportunity, if that's you, to pray with us just right now. It's a really simple prayer. Many in this room have prayed it before. And the reason why we pray this is because the Bible tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. And that's a promise from God, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts. And you know, church, I can't see the condition of your heart right now, but we do want to give you an opportunity to confess with your mouth and to follow that up with belief so that you can be in Christ, that he can save you from your sins, and you can have every blessing that belongs to him. So if that's you, would you pray with me right now? If that's you and you say, I want to be in Christ, just pray with me like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've made mistakes. I'm asking you right now, Jesus, to forgive me of my sin, to be my boss, my savior, my Lord. I'm not going to do this my way anymore. I'm surrendering my life to you in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, if you're here today and you just prayed that prayer with me, just raise your hand and wave at me and say, that's me, Pastor. I just prayed with you. Just say, that's me. Yes, sir. I just prayed with you. Would everyone look this way? None of you raised your hand this morning. It may be that you prayed, but you just didn't feel like raising your hand or were worried about being embarrassed. That's fine. We'd love to talk with you after the service and help you with those next steps to, to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And church, I want to encourage you as always to invite your friends and family, especially those that you don't know if they have a relationship with Christ or not. Thank you so much. It's been my great privilege to share with you this week.